Hello and good evening. I'm Paul Farber. I'm director of Monument Lab and I'm senior research scholar at the Center for Public Art and Space at the Weizmann School, the University of Pennsylvania. And I am thrilled to welcome you um, tonight to hear from Sue Mobley um, for tonight's lecture, Designing Dissenting Histories. Um, the Center for Public Art and Space is a platform for artistic research and civic engagement at the University of Pennsylvania's Weizmann School of Design. Um, and we support Penn faculty, staff, students, and visiting scholars and artists uh, in incubating public art projects um, and working on critical initiatives that bridge the campus and the public realm in Philadelphia and beyond. I am thrilled to introduce visiting scholar Sue Mobley uh, for a lecture tonight. Um, Sue is an urbanist based in New Orleans. Um, Sue has um, sat on a number of different important, meaningful projects, commissions. Um, among them um, is a co-founder of uh, Paper Monuments, um, is on the New Orleans City Planning Commission, um, and has quite recently, after many years of close collaboration, joined Monument Lab as the Director of Research. Um, I've had the great opportunity of working with Sue across many years and really value Sue's vision thoughtfulness and care in working on issues of art, history, and civic engagement. Um, so we're gonna hear from Sue, um, who will be giving the talk. Um, we'll have time for question and answer. Um, and uh, we're really excited for you to engage. And I wanna, um, before we start, just thank the, the team at the Weitzman School um, and at Monument Lab for uh, co-hosting and co-presenting this event. Um, but without further ado, I want to hand off to dear friend, colleague, Sue Mobley for tonight's lecture. Hi, Sue. Hello, Paul. Hi. We're going to try what I think is the trickiest part of every talk, um, switching over to sharing my screen. Okay, that seems to have worked. The looks project, hmm? It looks great, Sue. Awesome, I'm never sure. The projects that I'm exploring today and inviting you to explore with me are a series of interventions expanding how we engage with, interrogate, and understand history in public, because I believe that in public is the place where we most need to engage history. These projects have taken place over the past four years. And in many ways, they map my personal response to the imperatives that drove the Trump administration. History making as a project and as an inherently political project is largely enacted through the synthesis of contested narratives into a singular and unassailable voice of authority by people who have the power to make that synthesis happen. The subaltern, the rest of us, are erased, or at best referred to in aggregate, while those who had power and agency are given their names, given credit for their own actions and the actions of others, and inevitably given the benefit of the doubt. This work has taken place in a range of settings, I'll be talking about projects with the Small Center for Collaborative Design at Tulane University, with Paper Monuments and Co-Locate Design, with Monument Lab, and with the New Orleans City Council Street Renaming Commission. So let's start with sites of resistance. Between the 2016 presidential election and the 2017 inauguration, I spent several months working with emerging organizations and mobilization efforts across my city and region. Some of that was getting to know and connect with new leaders. And a lot of that was helping to train people to work together well, which also meant that a lot of that was helping to train people who were suddenly shocked by what their country had become 
to listen and take leadership from people who knew that this was what our country had always been. So there was a lot of new organizing energy and there were a lot of protests and direct actions. Um, as an organizer and as a legal observer, I was present at 54 marches in 2017. And I kept hearing from people who were coming to direct action for the first time that this was so amazing and so powerful and that it was exciting to see something happen. And my personal favorite, it's so nice to see someone who um, looks like you um, at a political protest. And in almost every case that was immediately followed by because there's no history of protest in New Orleans. But here's the thing. There's a tremendous history of protest in New Orleans. Protest in all manner of forms, marches and sit-ins certainly, but also the quiet and dangerous protest of creating and sustaining integrated spaces. The long, slow legal strategies of challenging discrimination and exclusion a labor history of alliances, strikes, slowdowns and solidarity actions, and of course, the occasional massacre or riot. So we set out to map that history of resistance. And in seven weeks over the summer of 2017, pulled from every available primary and secondary source to make visible New Orleans history of protest from 1863 to present. The exhibit took the form of two wall-sized maps of the city with specific events tied to place and defined by broad categories, strike, nonviolent direct action, things like sit-ins and boycotts, marches, rallies and assemblies, violent conflicts. We made a deliberate choice to focus on events where we could identify the collective presence of people in space for the purposes of mapping which was by extension, a choice to exclude most legal battles. A second deliberate choice was to map the protests and actions that upheld the status quo, not just those that worked to overturn it, to make visible the Mechanics Institute riot and the White League battles of reconstruction, to trace the movement of mobs responsible for the lynching of 11 Sicilian immigrants in 1891 and Robert Charles in 1901, both of which involved thousands of white New Orleanians rioting through much of the city, wreaking havoc and killing additional victims. Wall panels told extended stories of particularly pivotal moments and movements, allowing a deep dive into the strategy and tactics which best seem to offer new possibilities for approaching our current challenges. So I tend to think of exhibits as containers, an opportunity to ensure that we're all working from the same baseline knowledge um, or sharing background context, and then to have a conversation together from those grounds. Sites of Resistance held a series of conversations with Bill Quigley, longtime civil rights lawyer, about how to stay in the work over the years and decades with Dr. Cedric Johnson about how class and race intertwine in incidents of police violence and how a sharper focus at those intersections can improve not just our analysis, but create new opportunities for building coalition and shared ground in pushing for greater reform. Sites of Resistance also held a series of panel discussions which I deliberately stacked with intergenerational groups of women, where we gathered to dive deeply into conversation about the nuts and bolts of political organizing from the community level through voter registration and engagement, policy work and running campaigns, and to talk about the emergence of a newly energized labor movement, which is seeing its greatest strides in areas of work that are traditionally feminized, teaching, nursing, domestic labor, care labor, 
A simple and accessible hands-on portion of the exhibit allowed for crowdsourced mapping of protest from 1990 to present. Visitors use yarn and paper labels to give the dates, demands, and roots of direct actions that they had participated in, engaging them as participants in the process of remembering and delineating the relationships of people to situated power across the city. By the end of the exhibit, clear and nuanced patterns of use were visible, and it was possible to see recent shifts in the terrain of protest with the removal of four Confederate monuments. The historical evidence and ongoing programs provided by Sites of Resistance contributed to the specific inclusion of protest as an integral, desirable, and protected function of place during the recent redesign process for Duncan Plaza across from City Hall. Paper monuments. At the same time that I was working on Sites of Resistance, I began work on another related project, which I co-directed with architect Brian Lee. Paper Monuments was a public art and public history project enacted in New Orleans from 2017 to 2019. Paper Monuments emerged in the context of the removal of four Confederate statues from New Orleans streets. More specifically, it began with a conversation at the third of the takedowns the late night removal of the Beauregard Monument from the entryway to New Orleans City Park. Where a group of us, activists, artists, planners, architects, anthropologists, started asking what's next. The paper monuments also developed in the context of a much longer standing project with roots in a group of scholars, myself included, who had built an intellectual community around the work of unexceptionalizing New Orleans, weaving it back into the larger historical, political, and social narratives of the South, of the Atlantic world, and of the nation. We're working against the centrality of tourism um, and the tourism narrative to perceptions of New Orleans history, which are so strong that they have shaped scholarly work and define public investment. They've created a shorthand of cultural signifiers that authentically typify the city. Gumbo, jazz, exotic race mixing, and languid debauchery, as well as a notion of New Orleans as a colonial other. Slow and lazy, not driven by capitalism, lagging behind the times. And that notion is wild it's a rescripting of a critical port, which was formerly capital of the domestic slave trade and whose destruction and rebuilding after Hurricane Katrina laid bare the depths of inequity created by neoliberal logics and served as a laboratory for the American version of disaster capitalism that we are seeing enacted all of the time. New Orleans isn't left behind, it's a predictive city. And the economic motives behind New Orleans historical construction as a tourism marketing device are particularly transparent. However, it only really differs from more traditional history making processes because of that transparency and because of the persistence and the large paychecks of uh, the messengers within that market driven framework. Anyway, Paper monuments drew heavily on our collective backgrounds in community engaged design to layer various modes of public art and public history. Working with 80 scholars and artists and over 200 volunteers, we created posters and installations to expand public knowledge of New Orleans rich and often contested histories, tell those stories in compelling ways and create accessible installations and events in public and civic spaces. To challenge the authority of New Orleans known and marketed history, paper monuments relied heavily on the network of, low, of formal scholars for our poster series, asking that they lend their expertise to the project of disrupting conceptions of history while admittedly upholding academic hierarchy. To counter that regrettable necessity, we paired scholarly narratives and locally commissioned artwork to amplify the stories of New Orleanians who were poor and working class, 
black and brown, women and children, lesbian, gay, trans and queer, immigrants and refugees, those who fought battles for inclusion and justice, who worked to improve lives and bring hope and who are extremely unlikely to be elevated on any pedestal. We also collected nearly 1,200 public proposals for new monuments, inviting residents to imagine new monuments for New Orleans and modeling our approach to data collection after our sibling project, Monument Lab. Our goal was a radically democratic one. We wanted every resident of New Orleans to have an opportunity to have a voice in this process. Public proposals were the core of paper monuments, an expansive pool of perspective monuments, memorials, policy proposals, and public art that range from the intimate to the epic and told the stories that are important to New Orleans residents. In September of 2018, Paper Monuments put out an open call for local and regional artists. The artists were asked to draw upon both the poster series and the themes for our growing catalog of public proposals to develop works for Paper Monument Represents, a collection of 10 temporary public art installations distributed throughout the city in March and April of 2019. Lydia Stein created remediation, a field of 15 foot sunflowers made of bamboo and paper mache that towered over the intersection of St. Bernard and Claiborne avenues while in turn standing in the shadow of the highway overpass. Remediation was a direct reference to the widespread planting of sunflowers in 2006 and 2007 in an effort to remediate soil across the city after Katrina and was recognized and remembered as such by the neighborhood residents and passerby. Brandon Palmer and Jell created Together, a collection of portraits of the intergenerational Black community in New Orleans' West Bank neighborhood of Algiers. The portraits, which when assembled create a profile of a young Black girl through the use of negative space, were installed in the Del Cazelle playground, located on a current de facto segregation line in the neighborhood. The elders represented were touched to see their faces monumentalized in a playground they had been prohibited to use as children under Jim Crow. And poet Sonny Patterson, a frequent paper monuments collaborator and one of those featured in the piece, provided deeper history for the site selected, revealing that the Jim Crow playground had been built atop an antebellum cemetery on the Duverge plantation while the bodies of the slave owners had been reinterred in suburban Metairie in the 1910s, the bones of those that they had enslaved remained buried under our feet. Jeffrey Andrews, Why Do You Call New Orleans Home? drew upon the public proposals that elevated the quotidian culture of New Orleans, interpreting them in a series of watercolor portraits and narratives from, from mid-city residents. It was remarkable how recognizable they were. These bayou side images of people you run into at the coffee shop or the grocery store. And their responses to her prompt echoed through the public proposals as well. New Orleans is home because it is home to a generosity of spirit, a sense of belonging and a quietly astounding people. In keeping with broader national trends, reconsidering their popular reputation, we received a number of public proposals referencing the affirmative role of the Black Panthers in New Orleans through their community feeding, healthcare, and education programs. Nick Richard's piece, Showdown at Desire, reinvented and reinterpreted photographs of the Black Panthers' violent expulsion from the Desire housing projects by police in 1970. And by violent, I mean there was a tank, y'all. We also developed a number of the public proposals into architectural renderings to show how they might look as monuments in the streets of New Orleans. In many ways, Sites of Resistance and Paper Monuments were twin projects for me. I started both simultaneously and they served as buckets for different stories, different lines of thinking about narrative, 
um, about creating possibilities for change. And working on them simultaneously allowed me to shift back and forth, um, thinking about different audiences, where a particular story belonged, and how it was best told. The next project we'll explore had a very different structure um, and presented new challenges. One of which was, as an admitted control freak, uh, learning how to not be in charge. Martin Luther King Jr. Memorial Library. As director of advocacy for Co-Locate Design, I worked with an interdisciplinary team to develop the showcase exhibit for the redesign of Washington DC's Martin Luther King Jr. Public Library. The team brought together Studio Joseph, Workhorse, Blue Cadet, Open Box, Cubic Maltby, three advisory groups, and of course the public library staff. Our charge was to develop an exhibit that recontextualized Martin Luther King Jr. within the city of Washington DC and within a larger lineage of activist movements and to connect the civil rights movement of the 1950s and 60s to the present. Oh, and of course, to make it engaging, accessible and immersive, both for the people who had been present at the events shown as well as those who wouldn't be born for 50 years later. That seems easy enough, right? So the most exciting part of this project was the opportunity to dive deep into the incredible archives at DC Public Libraries, as well as archival materials from Howard University and the Smithsonian. We had a lot to work with. So I set about mapping the web of relationships between individuals, organizations, events, and issues that grounded Dr. King in the city and stretched the civil rights era backwards to the turn of the 20th century through figures like Nanny Helen Burroughs, Mordecai Johnson, and Mary McLeod Bethune, and forward through figures like Mayor Marion Barry, Casilda Luna, and Eleanor Holmes Norton to the turn of the 21st. I really love a good map. There's always a map, y'all. There was a central shared understanding that this large, somewhat unwieldy collaborative design group brought to the table. If we were gonna meet any of the goals laid out for the project, we needed to break fully with the normal presentation of the civil rights movement. We needed to make some big, simple moves that would prevent us from arguing our way back to those norms with every image or artifact up for inclusion. We all have experience with the typical visual presentation of Dr. King and the civil rights movement. You know it, it looks like this. Black and white photographs of Dr. King in front of very large crowds, leading marches with hundreds of signs, and certainly when in the nation's capital against the backdrop of the federal city um, and its monuments. So the first big simple move is to denaturalize that visual of the civil rights movement, to move it out of the fictive distant past and into proximity by moving it out of black and white. The smaller but more persistent work of denaturalization was to show more intimate portraits, placing everyday people against the backdrop of the big crowds showing the texture of normal needs and everyday annoyances of embodied life, and zooming in on a more nuanced and more ambitious set of demands than the simplistic narratives of our sanctioned history textbooks. The second big move was to lean hard into the context of the 1968 Poor People's Campaign. King's last campaign, which wouldn't come into fruition until after his assassination, and which many believe was the cause of his assassination. We did this in part by echoing the form and massing of Resurrection City, the 90-day village on the National Mall, which had, in its own time, echoed the temporary dwellings of the 1932 Bonus Army, World War I veterans hit hard by the Depression, and denied payment for their service to the country. 
The other part, of course, was centering the demands of the Poor People's Campaign for a massive federal investment in the expansion of human well being and economic opportunity. And it turns out that when you ground your presentation of Dr. King in the fight for meaningful jobs at living wages, the right to unionize, investments in safe, decent housing and land access, voting rights, free health care, and stopping police brutality, connecting to the present isn't very hard at all. New Orleans City Council Streets Renaming Commission. I was talking on the phone one morning when suddenly a bunch of text messages came through and I ignored them. So that was unwise, don't do that. Imagine my surprise when I finally got off the phone and discovered that my favorite city council member had from the podium into the public record, Volen told me that I would be developing a process to rename all of New Orleans Confederate streets in the wake of George Floyd's murder and the ensuing protests. Yeah, like that. It was early in the morning too. On the face of it, that sounds reasonably straightforward. In 2015, the Times Picayune published a map of Confederate streets, places, and a handful of monuments as the discussions began about taking the ladder down. It's fairly easy to identify guys like General Robert E. Lee, Confederate President Jefferson Davis, and hometown favorite Pierre Gustave Toussaint Beauregard as the names to remove, right? Well, actually, it's a little bit more complicated than that. So this process began with developing an ordinance that would define the terms under which the streets were identified for removal and establishing the independent commission that would guide the process of recommending names for removal and replacement. New Orleans City Council motion number M2170 laid out extremely clear terms for removal. The role of the individual or group in fomenting the treason committed against the United States of America and the US Constitution between 1861 and 1865. The role of the individual or group in the denial of the protections and rights afforded to citizens outlined, outlined in the 13th Amendment to the US Constitution after 1865, the 14th Amendment to the US Constitution after 1868, and the 15th Amendment to the US Constitution after 1870. That was, I promise you, the last straightforward part of this process. So the first speed bump was that we wrote the ordinance to create a committee. But you can't create a committee by city council ordinance. You can create a commission. And someone who has read all of city code more closely than I caught that in one of the rounds of revisions. But also, uh, you can't serve on two commissions at once. And I already serve on the City Planning Commission. Oops, but that's okay. Because the role I actually wanted to play was a supporting role anyway. So instead of serving on the commission, I worked with longtime co-conspirator Thomas Adams to co-chair the panel of experts, 16 scholars, formal and informal, supported by the archives staff at the New Orleans Public Library, Amistad Research Center, and the New Orleans Historic Collection to provide narratives on the individuals for whom streets were named, histories of how the streets came to be named after them in the Jim Crow era, and develop three proposals for renaming for each location under consideration. That's where the next series of speed bumps come in. This map is almost, maybe, the final map of New Orleans Confederate streets. Turned out that the Times-Picayune had misidentified a couple of streets as Confederate, which weren't, and missed a number that were. The team at the New Orleans Public Library found more streets that were named for Confederates and white leaguers, but also claimed a few that predated the Civil War. And it turned out, for all of us, that the best regarded historical source on New Orleans street names uh, wasn't as reliable as everybody thought. 
It also turns out that even when we're looking at the same materials, the ways that we're interpreting them is often very different. The small map at the top is Gardner's 1867 map of New Orleans, which shows an entire street grid through to the lake. On the bottom, Major General Banks 1863 map of fortifications for Union occupied New Orleans begs to differ. So why is the difference? Gardner's map was aspirational. It's part of an effort to sell plots of land in swamp that was barely drained in the 1890s. The corporations that owned the land and were raising funds for the draining had drawn streets and named them. The good people of Lakeview brought a counter report to the commission in which they claimed that Garner's map clearly indicated that the officers and gentlemen for whom these streets were named were being honored for their service in the Mexican-American War because the 1867 map was too soon after the Civil War to have named anything after them. So in some ways that's a silly argument, right? Like one, the streets simply aren't there. They're not there until the early 1920s when the first residents move into the very wealthy, extremely segregated neighborhood of Lakeview. The Gardner map was a marketing device. It's not an accurate portrayal of facts on the ground. But two, and more importantly, all but one of the guys named went on from fighting in the Mexican-American War to fight in the Civil War for the Confederacy. So still making them names that we should get rid of under this ordinance. On the other hand, the deep dive into the streets of Lakeview turned up two more names to remove. Despite the speed bumps, the streets renaming process offered some incredible opportunities. As co-chair of the panel of scholars that advised the commission, we were tasked with proposing 111 replacement possibilities, three for each street or park that fit the ordinance's purview. And there were so many incredible people to propose. Here are a few. Governor Pinchback, Lieutenant Governor Oscar Dunn, and several other Black Union officers who went on to serve in elected positions at local, state, and federal levels during Reconstruction. For four parallel streets in Lakeview, we proposed three collections of renames with different themes, and the commission voted to rename in honor of Celestine, George, Margaret, Elizabeth, and Jasper, self-emancipating enslaved people whose owners held some of the black back swamp land that would become that neighborhood. We proposed Father Louis J. Twomey, Jesuit brother, social justice organizer, and official at Loyola University, whose life goal was to create a society in which the dignity of the human person in whomsoever found shall be acknowledged, respected, and protected. Proposed Sarah Towles Reed, founder of the local affiliate of the American Federation of Teachers, whose activism and organizing was responsible for equalizing pay for male and female teachers, overturning the prohibition against employing married women, and whose work with African-American teachers for salary raises and unionization led to her facing charges of communism. Rodolphe Dedun, poet, journalist, and historian, he served as a militiaman fighting white supremacist insurrectionists at the Battle of Liberty Place and was one of the founders of the Comité de Citoyens, whose most famous legal battle, Plessy v. Ferguson, define the new limits of the Jim Crow era. For Doris Jean Castle, teenage freedom writer and core member of the New Orleans chapter of the Congress of Racial Equality, who spent her career working in poverty eradication and social service programs. Albert Walker Dent, first superintendent of Flint Goodridge Hospital, second president of Dillard University, first black fellow of the American College of Hospital Administrators, president of the National Health Con Council from 1953 to 1955, and instrumental in the formation of the United Negro College Fund. This is not a complete list of his accomplishments, y'all, it's wild. 
And Allison Judy Montana, big chief of the Yellow Pocahontas tribe of Mardi Gras Indians who died in 2005 while standing at the podium testifying to city council about police violence towards black masking Indians and their cultural practices. It really was an honor to have done this work. But along with the opportunities, of course, come the challenges. From the beginning of this process, we've seen a handful of extremely familiar names and faces participating in fairly transparent attempts to pull the commission outside of the bounds of the originating ordinance, proposing replacing the names of specific buildings rather than streets, demanding an expansion to everyone who ever benefited from slavery, and generally trying to tempt the commission into giving them grounds for a lawsuit. We're now beginning to see is a new variation on the standard practices of white wealthy neighborhood associations and their more overt white supremacist allies to throw sand in the gears. In addition to the tactic of splitting streets, which we've generally seen used nationally for MLK boulevards, the quirky new tactic is to propose reversion to pre-Confederate names for territory that these groups consider to be theirs by right rather than public space and part of the larger city. So in response to the renaming commission's recommendation to replace Robert E. Lee with beloved musician, songwriter, and producer, Alan Toussaint, whose studio and home were on that boulevard, the Neighborhood Association for Lakeview has proposed breaking off their part of the street to revert to the name Hibernia. Similarly, the Neighborhood Associations for the French Quarter would like to break off their section of Governor Nichols and revert to hospital rather than have the entire street named for civil rights attorney, Lolis Eli. The semi-defunct Monumental Task Force has its members petitioning to return Lee Circle to Tivoli Circle, honoring the Italian American community rather than rename it in honor of chef, civil rights activist, and feeder of presidents, Leah Chase. This process is still unfolding. Um, and by still unfolding, I mean I'm getting text updates from today's public hearing while I speak. So after several years, as a co-conspirator, I've finally been pulled into the Monument Lab team. Yes, it was my plan all along. And this summer's research residency with the New Jersey Historical Commission and Council for the Arts to explore the American Revolution prompted a whole new line of thinking for me about how explicit we need to make the history making project. Amber Wiley, an inspiration of mine from back at her days at Tulane Architecture, was one of our summer residents. In her project, looking at the Indian Queen Tavern, she kind of blew our minds. The tavern, if you went to visit it today, would not be found on its original site. That's, that's what the highway is down there. Instead, you would find it as part of the bucolic village setting of East New Jersey, Old Town. That setting is how we often envision the colonial era, but it's not the Indian Queen Tavern looked like in the colonial era when it was a bustling way station for travelers and traders. And it's certainly not what it looked like for most of New Brunswick's history. But we envision the colonial era the way that we do because of folks like Joseph H. Clerk an ophthalmologist, hospital president, and stamp collector who founded and shaped East New Jersey Old Town Inc. by collecting colonial buildings and preserving them as a historical site while also stripping them, including the Indian Queen Tavern, of the context of their built and social environments. So now I'm thinking a lot about not just how we, we reweave narratives and address the silences in the archives and erasures in the historical record, but also about 
how we restore names and agency to the actors who enforced those silences, who created those erasures, and who shape, reshaped the historical record in their own images. How to denaturalize and elevate the act of history making to show intent and self-interest at play in creating the histories that we know, but also to assert our own right to make and shape different histories, to dream together backwards as well as forwards. And I'm thinking a lot right now about what Monument Lab offered to Paper Monuments back in 2017, about how much we learned and how many mistakes we didn't have to make because our sibling project was always a few steps ahead. And I'm thinking about the space that we held for each other to think and talk about the ways in which the work manifested differently in Philadelphia and New Orleans, places with very different histories, very different cultures, and very, very different climates. And I'm thinking about that as I try to envision what it looks like to apply those learnings in 10 cities, how to adapt and support a cohort of field offices which are exploring their own places and their own histories and proposing their own futures. And wondering what it might look like to tell stories to new audiences, to engage in a admittedly shifting national conversation on monumentality, race, and history to collect speculations and monumental dreams on paper after a pandemic, how to be in public space together again, and how on earth to offer as much wisdom, humor, and good common sense as I was lucky enough to find in Paul and Lori and the Monument Lab team. But those are my questions, and now it's time for yours. Thank you all very, very much for listening to me. Thank you, Sue. That was fantastic. As always, I, I get to um, speak to you almost every day, but um, to just hear the arc of your projects um, in and out of New Orleans and, and, and elsewhere is just breathtaking. So wherever you are, um, please um, give a shake, uh, give an applause, um, give, give acknowledgement and respect um, here for Sue. Um, we have a few questions um, that are coming in. And just in the interest of time, um, I want to just turn to them now. Um, and and um, I'll, have, I'll save some questions in my pocket um, in case. Um, so the first question comes from Patricia Kim. Hi, uh, uh, brilliant Dr. Kim. Um, thank you so much, Sue, for sharing your work, insights and expertise. I love learning about the range of your projects, your work in more depth. I appreciate your comment about, quote, learning to not be in charge. Could you please comment on what it means to share authority in a few contexts, in public engagement, and in deep data dives that you take on as a researcher? I'm thinking about challenges and joy. And again, gratitude to you, Sue, from Dr. Kim. Thank you, Dr. Kim. That's such an incredible question because it's wildly hard um, and always variable. Not being in charge in deep dive research is giving people tools to like take risks and safety nets so that it's not a case of you went too far and I'm yelling at you um, or you didn't find the thing I wanted. Not being in charge owns when we are creating horizontalism that's fake. Um, it, requires that we own how much authority we have, whether it's formal or informal, um, and think about our positionality vis-a-vis um, -vis the people that we're working with. Sometimes that means, you know, admitting that like I'm there is stuff above my pay grade and I won't be making that final decision. I can just make the best argument for it. Sometimes it means making sure that volunteers are trained extremely well to de-escalate conflict. Um, before they go out into the world where armed white supremacists show up at your events. Hmm. We have another question um, from uh, Asa Ana. Um, 
and um, more gratitude for your for your great work. And um, and the question is, I see Sue as a cartographer, um, and of course, as a sidebar behind Sue, of course, um, are lots of maps. Um, and and as the questioner asked, mapping is clearly an important part of your work, um, let alone your your workspace. Can you talk about your experience translating maps? What is that process? Um, I have always loved maps. Um, I was that kid with all the National Geographic's uh, middle sections um, and the keeper of the uh, AAA travel ticket uh, on family vacations. I think I am a spatial learner, um, not necessarily a visual one. And so for me, the process of uh, thinking is the process of moving through space and the process of talking. And those are both um, tied together. So if you, if I remember where I was, I can remember what I was saying and I can remember what was happening. Translating that outwards is um, mapping of various varieties seems to be the easiest way to at least begin to show someone else what's going on in my brain. Mapping space together seems to be the easiest way to um, be able to define how we understand it differently. So maps, I think, are good places to start a conversation. Um, and I wish I were a cartographer. That would be super cool. <laughs> At least unofficially, you are one. Um, so uh, you should get your card carrying. So we have another um, question from Jacqueline Smith. Um, again, much gratitude. Thank you so much for your work. I wonder where the names of anyone still living proposed for the street naming project. How do you feel about immortalizing those whose legacies are still actively evolving? Understanding, of course, that legacies can evolve after death as well. A, a great question. That's an awesome question. Um, like a multi-part answer. One, there was one person who was proposed um, from outside actually of the uh, panel of experts process who is still living. There is some discussion about whether that person um, will remain. New Orleans has a regulation that you have to have been deceased for five years before a street can be proposed in your honor. There's been some discussion about changing that regulation because there are one, we've just lost so many people this past year um, whose legacies are certainly not going to change. Um, and then two, we have a number of folks that are, are worth honoring who don't meet those parameters. It's also sort of an arbitrary parameter, but it addresses the, the latter part of your question, that people's legacies evolve um, after their death. Um, one of the things that was really interesting to me in this process was that there is a whole generation of um, free people of color in New Orleans who we had anticipated proposing street renames for. And having made the rule inside the panel of experts that we would not propose anyone who had owned slaves, we then had to rule all of them out. And there was some internal debate on the panel of experts about whether we would um, sort of look for evidence or, or give weight to folks who had bought family members and freed them or who had um, bought people to protect them from being sold elsewhere. And we spent actually several weeks pulling um, as much as we could to try to figure out who that would apply to. And at the end of the day, a lot of the folks who got rolled out had bought slaves because that was how you built a fortune. It was how you built wealth for yourself. It was the economic system of the time and they were participating in the economic system of the time. And somewhere in the discussion of whether we were really going to rule them out, I realized that you know, our grandchildren are going to look at the displacement of human suffering to the developing world that late stage capitalism has enabled and look at our engagement in this economic system and raise some real red flags. Look at the damage that we've done to the earth and the people on it. And I don't know that we will be uh, in any position to talk about anyone else. I do know that 
that evolution of legacy, um, that concept of future us's, that we weren't good enough morally, that we weren't good enough humans, is a future that I desperately want to see. Please look back and take our names off things. Please have done better. So uh, that relates to a question that actually has come in through the chat um, that is asking about um, naming and memorialization. Um, and the question um, from uh, Yolette Asha is that I'm curious if you've dove into conversations about naming um, that shifts away from the naming of individuals, but rather names um, and, and deals with terminology that memorializes historical and cultural practices. I keep trying. I do. I keep trying. Um, people really, really want to name things after people. Um, we slid some important words and themes into our list of proposals. We tried to pull in a poem um, and a couple of different cultural practices and they get bounced every time. They get bounced at the, um, the stage of our panel ranking their preferences, the stage of public comment at the stage of the commission vote. I think in order to embrace other kinds of naming practices, um, we have to do like much deeper work to frame for folks why like naming after something that isn't a human, a singular human, or building something to honor someone who isn't a singular human is worth doing. I think it's it's very hard to move past the, um, the traditional practice, even when we want to be uh, critiquing it um, through the process of renaming or remaking. Mm. I'm gonna keep trying though. Mm, that's great. Um, a question from Sierra Stein. How do you make sure the outcomes of the research and design and planning proposals are commensurate with the importance of the research and respecting these histories? You stay in them and you push and you yell. Um, you build enough buy-in so that when the outcomes start to slide backwards to the status quo. There's somebody around to push and say, don't let it. Um, and you recognize that that sometimes means, you know, over a period of years or decades, um, keeping something alive. And sometimes that works. Often it doesn't. It's like all movement work. Um, we are always both fighting the last battle and fighting the next one. And we're perpetually fighting against people who think in terms of generations. Mm. You know, we're, we're running um, close on time. I wanna ask just a final question um, before we um, sign off. Um, it's in the spirit of nourishment because um, it's hard to feel nourished in these moments in the same ways that we may have in our other projects. and. In your work, as you as you've explained, and I, you know, and our Monument Lab team have the great benefit to feel that your participation is so embedded into the DNA of every step of the of the project. So, in this moment, what are your sources of nourishment um, for this kind of work that you do? Um, I am planting things a lot. I've been planting things a lot over the past four years, but um, particularly over this past year. And I am finding nourishment in shifting what I'm planting so that I am not growing what all of my neighbors are growing and planting things that will in time grow and hang over my fence and provide food for the people who live around me. Um, so I am finding nourishment in the process of connecting with people now to make sure that our needs are met and the process of thinking about future needs um, and hopefully encouraging us to meet those together. Mm, that's great. Sue, there's so much more to say and to think about, but this has been such a treat. Again, wherever you are, if you can applaud, shake the furniture, bang pots and pans, puts energy out there and gratitude for Sue. Um, 
I would also encourage you to follow um, Sue on, on Twitter at Winged Isis. You can also follow um, at Weitzman School and at Monument Lab um, to keep up with, with the projects that Sue is working on. Um, I've been getting some texts in that say the question is, Sue, why are you so awesome? Um, so let's echo that and hope that this group gets to convene in other ways. But just thank you so much, Sue, for this lecture, for all your work collaboratively and um, with us and out there in the world. Thank you so much, Paul. Thank you, everybody, for hanging out. If you follow me on Twitter, you get lots of politics. It'll be fun. All right, everyone. Good evening. See you again at a Weitzman School event or a Monument Lab event. Um, and gratitude for all of you for joining us. And again, much gratitude for Sue.